Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us for this panel on the stablecoin phenomenon. I'm really excited to be chatting with uh, the folks here today. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Franklin B. Uh, I'm a director at Pantera Capital, where we invest into blockchain and cryptocurrency projects, uh, including Reflexor Labs. Um, with me are Sam from Frax and Amin from Reflexor. Um, why don't we start off with uh, just some basic introductions? Um, Sam, let's start with you. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about Frax, what the vision is, and sort of a user-friendly version of how it works. Sure, yeah. It's good to be here. So uh, I'm Sam. I'm the founder of uh, Frax. Um, behind me is actually Jason. We're both the core devs. Uh, work every day, basically, uh, nonstop. So a little bit about background about Frax and, and us. Um, we started in 2019. Um, we are famous kind of now for, for two things. One is bringing the idea of a fractionally backed stablecoin. Um, that's where it gets the name Frax, fractional algorithmic stablecoin. Um, and recently, uh, what we've been working on is what we call the Frax price index, which is actually, um, to my knowledge, the first attempt to make a crypto native consumer price index on chain uh, to have potentially other stable coins, including second stable coin that we're going to uh, launch peg to this uh, new unit of account. So we're kind of famous for stability mechanism as well as our, our work in the stability uh, you know, on-chain research and development. And it's been really good. Fraxis uh, has almost 300 million uh, circulating supply. It's one of the most liquid stable coins and it has one of the most novel stability mechanisms. And we're growing really fast and kind of on the bleeding edge, just like with uh, Amina Reflexor of, of the stable coin science of the space. Very cool. And Amin, how about you? Yeah, uh, I've been fascinated with stable coins for a while. Um, I actually met Sam. Uh, maybe it wasn't the first time we met, but we hung out at the EOS launch party and we both like shared our stable yeah. ideas. This is like mid 2018. And lo and behold, three years later, we're like doing it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I uh, helped start Reflexor uh, along with the, the CEO, Stefan. Um, we, it, Reflexor is a fork of MakerDAO. Uh, so I, I sort of fell in love with MakerDAO and DAI when it was like really easy to explain. It was like, it's backed by ETH and yeah, it's like cypherpunk money. Uh, you know, if, 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 if it gets a little unstable, then they change the interest rate and then it gets more stable and that's about it. Right. There wasn't like multi-collateral. It wasn't a whole lot of stuff. And so we tried to build Reflexor to be, uh, to, to build the asset Rye, the company Reflexor, um, which is, uh, stable and only backed by ETH and uh, has the uh, a tweak uh, to MakerDAO's design, which is that uh, instead of being fixed at $1, we actually let it float. And the way it floats is controlled by an algorithmic controller and it floats uh, in order to preserve its own stability without needing uh, centralized collateral like you know USDC, which is what MakerDAO uses to keep DAI at $1. So... Uh, we think that Rye could also be a, uh, you know, useful asset for for DeFi, for reserves, for DAOs, for for people in, in Ethereum to use. And and if it does work, then perhaps you know the world. Very cool. Very cool. So just to take a step back here, because I know there's a lot of folks in our audience who are maybe new to DeFi, new to crypto, um, and still sort of wrapping their heads around stable coins. Um, when we think about sort of the history of um, sort of stable coins outside of crypto today, um, you know, it's it's kind of fair to say that, you know, there's always been the concept of a stable coin, right? A stable value asset. And, you know, whether it's nation states or central banks that have tried to create a stable value asset in all different ways, you know, a fixed peg, a fiat decree, some reserve of various assets, including gold, um, you know, they've mostly failed, at least up till sort of, you know, this modern financial system that we have. Um, so from your perspective, why now? Why is DeFi sort of uniquely equipped um, to succeed at creating stable coins where, you know, traditional finance has failed? Um, and what are those sort of unique mechanisms or unique aspects of DeFi that your project is, is capitalizing on? 
Um, I mean, why don't we start with you? All right. Uh, so why has everyone until now failed? <laughs> it's like pretty bold to try and answer that question, uh, but we'll, we'll take a shot at it. Right. So uh, uh, up until now, you know, there, there's a couple different types of like money, right? Uh, there, there's the fiat money that, you know, governments just de de decree. They say it's, you know, this much we accept it in taxes and so forth. There's, you know, attempts at the gold standard, uh, and then there's things like the special drawing rights uh, from the IMF that is also a form of money. Um, and and the the problem of money is like fundamentally you want your money to be stable relative to the things that you spend it on. Like if I had a perfect money, it would like always you know get me the same amount of like whatever life goods I you know spent spent uh, need to buy. Um, but, but then the only way to get money that does that is to give complete control, uh, to someone to manage it, to increase and decrease the supply in order to, uh, respond to changes in demand for the money itself. Uh, and, uh, up until, you know, until today, uh, it's, it's very hard to trust the people who do that, um, because the rules are somewhat opaque. Uh, and, and the place that the rules are executed is like, you know, some government's like notebook. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we now have Ethereum where we can create these programs that run transparently uh, and are able to be verified globally and are sort of global by default because, you know, when you create this money or, or a system, it, you can use it anywhere in the world. And so the, the powerful thing that we have today is the ability to create these rules-based systems uh, that can that can um, ex expand trust much faster uh, potentially than uh, the the more opaque legacy systems that have a, a lot more baked in trust assumptions. Um, and and so even if you are you know expanding and contracting your money, uh, you can do it in like a much more transparent way. Actually, this is what I love about Praxis uh, design. I'm sure Sam will uh, ex expand on that in a second. <laughs> Yeah, Sam, tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So how does how does Frax sort of take advantage of what's unique in DeFi to achieve what hasn't really been achieved before? Yeah, so as, as Amin said really well, um, I think a lot of DeFi as well as crypto is, is kind of thinking about the broader questions in finance really quickly, right? Like, you know, people say like, oh, crypto is like all of finance like sped up in like one decade for like, you know, a few centuries, right? <laughs> uh, and one of the most important things to really think about that people are right now talking about is what stability is. And as Amin said, well, is ideally you have a currency that keeps your standard of living the same, right? And, and this concept of standard of living is, is really important because that's kind of what the uh, U.S. government, the you know BLS, and 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 the Fed look at in this consumer price index of, of consumer prices because they they say they, they look at sit and say okay uh, the average American should be able to buy this much food and and this much uh, clothing, cars, electrical uh, you know appliances and stuff and that stuff should be constant throughout time, because that's the definition of what a, your standard of living is. As, as people, we, we need some place to live. We need consume, consumer items and, and things like that. Um, I would actually slightly also push back on the original question of why has everything failed? I actually don't think that, uh, you know, looking at the dollar, it's, it's failed. In fact, it's kind of the uh, lingua franca of economic value, right? Everyone settles things in, in dollars. Uh, if you even just Google how much of global trade is settled in dollars, you immediately get back uh, government statistics of like 78, 79% of global trade is denominated and settled in uh, US dollars. And it's essentially kind of like the dollar is the SI unit of economic value. Right. The same way that like meters are the SI unit of distance. And so people, you know, talk about kilometers and this and that and or they talk about joules for energy. Right. And so we can communicate uh, about energy. We need something to communicate uh, about economic value. And for now, uh, the dollar seems to be doing uh, a fairly good job. However, um, obviously, there's very clear things that, that people 
think that can be done better, right? So a lot of things that people currently um, believe that is is not very good, as Amin said, is the opaqueness of how you even define inflation, right? If if the CPI is is how you define it, and and you know the dollar is being worthless, why don't you? What what if you de-weight some things in the CPI to conveniently hit your inflation target, right? And um, other people say the CPI is incomplete. So like, for example, real estate prices are not in the CPI, but rent prices are. And, and so the government response to that is rent is the consumable item of, of housing and, and like the, the land, the real estate is the investment asset. So they don't count that in uh, the standard of living, essentially, even though a lot of people, if they could democratically vote on this directly, I think it would clearly pass that they do uh, believe that owning land is uh, part of their standard of living and just calling it a consumer price index to discount that part into some other index uh, is is not uh, a, a very good idea. So we have this, this point that the thing that's supposed to be the stable unit of account is supposed to in some way to denominate a standard of living. Um, that's also why I think both Amin and I are really interested in the stable coin space, because I think when we got into crypto and, and I know Amin has been in this space for a really long time, I got into this space in like 2013 ish and, and stuff. And I remember when everyone was saying, oh, okay, like Bitcoin uh, is going to be used to pay for your coffee and, and stuff and everything's going to be denominated in Bitcoin. And there's a lot of, you know, Bitcoin maximalists and stuff that still say like everything will be hyper Bitcoinized and, and denominated in, in Bitcoin. And I think that it's becoming pretty clear as, as people discover, you know, the, the overlap of crypto with traditional finance and, and things like that, that it's not a good thing to denominate as a currency something that doesn't keep your standard of living the same. You can make the argument that the, the Fed and the current dollar and stuff is not doing a good job. It's, it's inflating very quickly and we need to re rethink how we de denominate it and, and, and measure inflation. That's all fine, right? But to say that you have this fixed scarce asset that's kind of this the gold view right the the um the austrian view that this thing that is extremely uh volatile in terms of purchasing power to the things we care about as humans uh is the perfect thing to use as as like currency because uh you can't trust the the people that uh are defining inflation and and, and changing the supply of the money that seems to a little far-fetched, right? We can fix the way that we define these things. Like I mean, saying use automation, use smart contracts, global coordination, using software and, and things like that. And that's why I think that uh, we're, we're really interested in the stable coin space. In fact, I'm, uh, I think that the third trillion dollar narrative in crypto is stable coins, especially algorithmic stable coins like like Rye and, and Frax and, and things like that. And we're we're huge, at least I am huge Bitcoin and Ethereum bulls. I think they're multi-trillion dollar uh, narratives as well. Um, I just don't think that they're the best thing to denominate uh, your, your standard of living in, in currency. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, let's dive into that a little bit, actually. Um, you know, at the sort of outside of this, um, you know, we talked about how Frax and Rye really are the cutting edge of stable coins, right? And, you know, for folks that have been in crypto for a while, there are sort of the, the old generation, I guess you could think of it that way, or sort of the first stable coins that have really stretched out the supply of stable coins now to over a hundred billion dollars. Um, you know, it's the USDC, it's Tether, it's DAI. Um, so can you help us kind of understand um, how you see kind of that generation of stable coins? Um, where are the gaps and how are you kind of solving for it? Uh, so um, I, you know, I think USDC is great. Like Coinbase is great. You know, I like to ca cash out, you know, it's easy. Uh, but I don't like... I've also built DAOs and I spent a lot of time uh, when I was like building a DAO, Malik DAOs, uh, focused specifically on like what happens if a token blacklists this contract or any address that could be a recipient of this contract. And the fact that like 
these you know stable coins have restrictions and and stuff like it, it, it matters to the people to the to the engineers who would build on top of them uh, and so um, these stable coins have you know driven an incredible amount of value and growth in the Ethereum ecosystem and in crypto generally. But the reason Sam and I are on the cutting edge is because we see the opportunity to go further. Um, for, for something like Rye, our goal is to you know, not use USDC, which some of the other stable coins do. Um, but and and in doing so, we you know we're kind of ETH maximalists, right? So like we we are you know if you if you didn't believe in the monetary value of ether at all, then like you might not be interested in Rye, right? If you if you believe enough that it's liquid and it's not going anywhere, then then you'll believe. But the the thing that um, Rye, Rye does that's unique is that it's one of the first stable coins to intentionally float. Uh, we do not peg to one dollar. In fact, we started at pi. We ran a Twitter poll. We're like, "What should we do?" You know, we're nerds. Pick a number, uh, and it was three point one four. Um, right now, Rise trading around three point oh two. Uh, it, it's been stable there about five, almost almost six months. Um, and the the way that the the uh, the redemption price, which is like if you go and you know uh, pull out debt from from Reflexer and Rye, like what what is the the price of the debt? Uh, that gets set by this algorithmic controller. And so uh, if the market price of Rye drops, uh, the system tries to stabilize uh, and, the, and it tries to bring the market price back up to the current redemption price, like 3.02. So if the market price drops like 2.95 or something, then uh, the redemption price starts increasing right, automatically, proportional to how much uh, the, the difference in, in the... Uh, you know, the error is, is the term for it. But um, so if, if it's, you know, if it's like twice as far, then the, it's, it, the redemption rate pr price climbs twice as fast. The, the, we have a redemption rate, which is the rate of growth of the redemption price. I'm not going to get in all that. But um, the, the point being is that uh, as a user of the system, you, you have then an expectation that some point in the future, the redemption price is going to be higher than it is today. And so you have this opportunity to make money by buying the the rye that's uh, on the market price that's depressed, you know, below the redemption price, and then waiting ultimately for the you know market price to uh, reach equilibrium again, and uh, being able to sell once it does and earn a profit from the arbitrage. And you sort of know you're going to win uh, because the longer that it doesn't happen, the higher that the redemption price goes, which means more money that you will eventually make when you you know, close this arm. Um, this is the most primitive type of controller uh, that exists, right? This is the simplest mathematical formula. It's like literally like price goes down, you go up proportional to the difference, right? There, there's more uh, sophisticated types of controller that we haven't uh, turned on yet. We have the integral term, you know, it's ready, but we haven't uh, turned it on. But for us, the the innovation is is really like this is like we just believe this is how money should work. Uh, like I just don't think uh, interest rates should be set by committee once every quarter. Uh, I think that's like pretty dumb. Uh, and like in the industry be beyond finance and, and and computer science, like all of the chemistry. So I studied chemical engineering. Uh, so I took this control theory class in college. Electrical engineers take it. Systems engineers take it. Finance nerds and computer science nerds do not take it. Uh, and so there's this gap uh, between like control theory, you know, uh, like, like, uh, 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 like chemistry nerds and physics, nerds, you know, and then like the software nerds and finance nerds and like control theory is like, hasn't totally been uh, bridged yet. And like, it just seems obvious that like, we should be using these, the, 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 the technology of stability, the, the entire, you know, uh, this field exists, right? It makes drones fly, it keeps industrial systems operating smoothly. Like this is the science of stability. Like why shouldn't, why don't we apply it to money? And uh, given that if you actually do look at how the interest rates are set by the Fed, like they'd follow rules and the rules actually approximate uh, algorithmic controllers like PID because uh, they have certain rules that are like, okay, we're going to, uh, you know, measure based on the, the proportional, you know, how much, how much are we off by our, in, you know, inflation targets now and how much have we historically been off by our inflation targets? And then we add those up and we have some sort of predictive term about how much do we anticipate being off. And like, that is a PID controller. Um, and, and so then the, the other thing that uh, Rai does that's unique is that we just put the controller directly in charge. Uh, 
we, we try to remove the humans from the, the loop. Uh, because once you know that the humans are just emulating a controller anyway, uh, then the greater instability in the system, we believe, is actually caused by the existence of the humans in the loop. Uh, and so the, the Fed, when they you know, are, are communicating about setting their interest rates and making these projections, are basically always gaslighting everyone, uh, where the, the, the game that they have to play uh, is to keep everyone guessing. Uh, because if, everyone, if anyone figured out their game completely, then it would actually lead to more instability. And so like everyone's just trying to game the Fed. The entire world is playing the, the J-POW trade, right? <laughs> uh, and, and like that causes massive instability to the system. Uh, and so, you know, what, one of our hopes for something like Rai is that like maybe the central banks will learn from this. Uh, maybe, you know, they, <laughs> they figure out control theory and like maybe they understand uh, that like they can actually, you know, win more by removing themselves. Uh, and and, and we, we talk about hard money and like, you know, hard money is like Bitcoin because it has a, you know, 21 million fixed cap. Right. Uh, but but I think there's also room for harder money uh, <laughs> where like, it, you know, maybe it's not quite a fixed cap, but at the very least, it like has, you know, fixed rules uh, and, and the rules that regulate it are, are, are harder to change. Uh, and so it's it's it, it still ends up being much harder to game. And so it ends up being more stable. Yeah, and, and uh, Amin said it really well with the automation part. So with, with Frax, there's some similarity actually there in the before Frax, a lot of the stability mechanisms for stable coins on chain were um, the current like leverage or over collateralized model that Rai uses and, and Dai uses. One of the things that we we brought to you know the, the stable coin theory is is the concept of look. There's uh, algorithmic ways to do fractional banking, essentially, where Frax is the first stablecoin that there isn't full amount of backing all of the supply of Frax. If everyone instantly for like right now went to redeem their Frax for collateral, uh, there wouldn't be enough. There's actually about 83% uh, collateral. However, like Amin said, there's this automated way that we created the protocol where the collateral ratio, which is the amount of collateral that the system has over the total amount of Frax in, in, in the market uh, increases uh, immediately, as soon as the price goes just a tiny bit uh, below the peg, so 99 cents, and we have a 1% window on each side to keep the peg very tight. And so once the price slightly goes down, what happens is there's the second token, which is the Frax shares token that's minted to increase the collateral, essentially the balance sheet assets of the, the protocol to essentially act as a anti-bank run mechanism, so to speak, right? And so people can know if, if people are voting essentially, right, to uh, sell the stable point because they're not confident in Right. If, if there's oh, OK, this thing is only 83 percent back, let me sell it for Rye or USDC or, or anything. Right. Um, that's going to be shown in the market. Right. The price is going to go from a one dollar peg to maybe ninety nine cents. This uses uh, the, the protocols, smart contracts, this automated system of deciding what the collateral ratio should be to increase the collateral ratio all the way up as, as until the, the peg actually uh, is restored. The other way uh, works as well. If there's a lot of demand for fracks, right? People want to farm with it. They want to hold it. Uh, there's a lot of frax integrations and things like that. The price will slightly go higher, right? There, it'll go to one dollar and one cent. People will pay a tiny premium for frax, and so. Um, what the protocol will do is it'll slightly lower the collateral ratio. Um, and again, this is done essentially automatically as part of the, the rules of, of the protocol. And um, the idea here is like, like Amin was saying, you create this kind of algorithmic uh, fractional kind of banking protocol where the rules are set, right? And, and just like kind of how Rai has uh, this PID controller that changes the redemption rate and, and things like that. Um, we kind of introduced this fractional model where it's more capital efficient to create money. Um, and so far we've held the peg perfectly in that 1% bound uh, of the window um, on each side. Now there's certain things that we need to you know, work on in terms of making fracks extremely decentralized like Rye. 
part of our collateral base is USDC as a uh, means that uh, makers collateral base is 62% uh, USDC, give or take. Ours is actually a little bit under our collateral ratio. We've slightly mixed uh, the, the actual collateral uh, assets that the protocol can intake. So it's, a, I would say it's in the seventies, give or take. So it's a little bit uh, higher, but again, it's, it's quite dependent. So one of the main things we're doing is figuring out the best way to keep our stability mechanism very, very sound and, and high performant while being able to entirely remove USDC dependence. In fact, um, one of the things we're releasing soon is a decentralization ratio. Uh, in addition to the collateral ratio, which is what the protocol uses entirely. But this is a new concept we have that's essentially um, a ratio of the protocol's balance sheet assets that have no custodial risk, right, and in no way. So that's things like Ether, which is what Rai is backed with, um, and other on-chain assets, um, and over the ones with custodial risk, like USDC, which has off-chain things, real world assets would have custodial risk and, and things like that. Um, and so that's going to be really cool. I think we're going to be one of the first stable coins that objectively is going to be like, this is how we define DR, the decentralization ratio. And this is how you can make very transparent market decisions on uh, how decentralized this is. Here's the collateral ratio. Here's the decentralization ratio. Um, and then you as a market participant of holding FRAX, for example, uh, you can decide. You sell it, right? If enough people sell it, it'll it'll go down to 99 cents and it'll increase the collateral ratio. Um, or is it fine? Do more people want it? And then, you know, the, the monetary base expands. And these are all rules on chain. And I think it's really, really cool to, to basically experiment with this stuff with with Rye, with Frax. And um, I think the most interesting part is as we develop these mechanisms, like Amin said, we see where the industry is going is the question of, is the unit itself uh, going to necessarily be the dollar? Or can we do better? Can we actually use the same science that we've developed for making these protocols to actually change what we define as our standard of living? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think just from like listening to you guys, it almost starts to feel obvious and inevitable that this is how money should work, especially now. Right. I mean, given that, um, you know, we can apply things like control theory uh, once we can do, you know, trustless automated execution um, and we should be taking advantage of market forces in enabling stability rather than constantly trying to resist market forces in some fashion. Um, but how do we go from experiment to reality, right? How do you guys think about taking the project you're building, um, and then achieving utility, achieving adoption in the near term? Is there a sequence of events in your head that you think will really get you there? I mean, why don't we start with you? This one's hard, uh, because like sometimes reality chooses you, uh, like, and what I mean by that is like, you know, uh, I accidentally, you know, made a whole tweet storm about Rye and like how it works and stuff like on the same day that like a bunch of regulations came out that were like antagonistic towards stable coins. People were like, did you time that? I was like, no, I was like late. I meant to do it last week. Uh, but like, you know, stuff like that happens. And then you're like, well, I guess it's time for us to use Rye. <laughs> right? Like, uh, so, you know, and that, that's what I mean by re reality chooses you. Right. Uh, the, um, I mean, I mean, for, for me, it's, it's, it, it never starts with, uh, the, the, the like, like, I, I don't actually know how to get there. Uh, what I know how to do is like make it work for my friends, uh, and like people who want to use DeFi like today. Uh, and if like, if we can get it to be used in the DeFi projects today, if it works, then it has a chance, mm -hmm. right? That Like DAI didn't, you know, start out with the goal of like becoming, you know, central bank, like type of thing. Maybe it did. I don't know. But uh, like at first, like DAI to me was like, okay, so like 2016, I'm sitting in consensus. We're like buying pizza, you know, let me send you 20 bucks. Okay. Here's it. Like, 
and ether, <laughs> right? Right. And it's like, we didn't have any stable coins. We were just using ether for lack of a better option. When DAI came out, I was like the best thing that had ever happened uh, to Ethereum. Uh, and, and so we, we all suddenly had a thing that we could actually use that corresponded to our standard of living. So we could buy pizza with it without feeling weird, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and, and that was great. Um, and, 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 and like, you know, DeFi summer came, uh, and then that, that catapulted the demand for DAI, uh, and then that put them on a global scale. And then, you know, the, the federal reserve state bank of St. Louis writes their DeFi report and mentions DAI 29 times. Right. It's like, okay, how did we get to here? <laughs> right. It's an inter- interesting path. Um, I, I, for me, I, I think it just starts with, a you know, making yourself useful to the the people who, who the most sophisticated users uh, first, like, and would, which is, you know, if, if Frax starts using Rye, then like, you know, I think we're on the right track. If, if Dai starts using Rye, you know, these are the things that I would consider important milestones for, uh, for the adoption of Rye. Yeah. And, and uh, totally, I actually have the exact same view on it. It's like a lot of people, right. When we launch Frax are like, well, when can my grandma use it? When's the mobile app or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know, like that, that's like asking Vitalik, like what, when are you going to release like a, like a Ethereum wallet on, on like on the app store, right? He's going to say, I don't care about that. I am I'm, I'm like down in the consensus and mechanisms and the cryptography and, and all of that stuff. Right. And so I think that also with us that have kind of been in the space for a while, uh, like, like it means says like, we were kind of junkies and into it before there was so much money and capital and interest in investing and, and stuff like that. We just really liked uh, what all this stuff meant from like a geeky perspective, right? Um, like I, I started in crypto mining Dogecoin, like like literally like the, the first or second week it came out. And like I was just into it and, and stuff. So I, I do the same thing. We just build for, for the, uh, you know, geeks and, and stuff like that. And, uh, if it's meant to be, they come, but one of the most important things though, that I've recently been thinking about that I think is a really concrete, um, important thing in, in our development of the Frax price index, which is what we're hoping to kind of, uh, jointly develop with, with Reflexor, um, with Olympus DAO, which is another, uh, algorithmic stablecoin project. Um, Faye has, has said they're also interested in collaborating in this. Um, the idea is like, if we're going to define like a new unit of account, um, it's important to build network effects around that unit, right? We see how important the dollar is in terms of unit of account, right? And the fact that all of these uh, stable coins try to peg towards this, this unit is almost like a shelling point, right? It's not like Tether, USDC, you know, Frax, all of these things. We don't know each other in terms of like, we're not a central organization, but we have this shelling point of a unit of account that because we all uh, peg the, try to peg to this, right? You're able to have deep liquidity on curve. You're able to have a lot of uh, stable coin farms together or something. You're able to have uh, Uniswap V3 range orders, which have like 100X capital efficiency to the the v2 kind of uh curves and and stuff right and one of the most important things is if we're to succeed right and 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 the question was how do we kind of make this uh come out uh, to to the real world is if we can all coordinate around a new unit of account so that for example you know rye isn't uh pegging to 3.14 3.14 and then Frax isn't saying we have the best unit. Actually, it's like uh this thing here that we've done. And then, you know, uh Olympus Dow is like, well, we are this, you know, floaty thing and we do that. And then, you know, Faye comes and says, uh, actually, like we don't like the the Frax price index. Uh, we like the Faye price index, and like, uh, and we don't think that you know their indexes have enough of this or that. And you kind of have the tragedy of the decentralization, which is a different form of tragedy of the commons where it's like you fracture it from the beginning. Right. And so like everyone is doing like something else themselves and you can't create curve pools that are tied on, on, on a peg, the peg, there's no legitimate peg. Everyone's just like trying to do their own thing. You, you can't have uh, a shelling point coordination around a, a new, you know, language of, of talking about value. And so one of the things we're focused on with the, with the Frax price index is to really try to make it 
it bigger than than ourselves. In fact, one of the first suggestions, I think it was Amin and also Joey that uh, said this was, let's come up with a name that everyone comes uh, thinks of and, and we actually rename it. So it's not just the FRAX price index, but it is bigger than ourselves so that um, that basically if we can all coordinate around something, we're, we're all at the bleeding edge of the algorithmic stablecoin space, right? Um, we have a much higher chance of reaching critical mass and, and bringing this to literally the, the planet, right? Because these are global digital markets rather than, um, you know, I have, you know, we have a price index and, and Rai has a target for their PID controller and, and like all of these things. Now, there, there is something to be said, though, about the fact that, you know, if you create platforms where people can create their own pegged currency, uh, it's, it's really important so people can create localized versions of whatever they want. But my personal view is just like how Bitcoin has a huge network effect and Ethereum has a new huge network effect. If you're going to try to take on the largest stable coin in the entire world, which is the US dollar, um, you, you can't do it with like this view of here's a localized version or here's this and, and here's that. And there's there's five different pegs and, and none of them have curve pools or any like stable farms or anything. And so that's kind of our goal with, with the FPI is first, can we get... Um, a lot of uh, really, really big brains, including you know Amin and Stefan, and and uh, you know hopefully Joey and the guys at Faye and Olympus and stuff, to be like, hey, we're the leaders in the space, undisputably. Like it's just us, right? And uh, no one can really stop us uh, if if we are to do something like this. Um, and so it's, it's hard because you, then you're trying to coordinate the original thing. Right. Um, but I think we've made a lot of really, really exciting progress as, as I mean, says like, we're, we're just going to go back to talking on, on telegram after this, right. And get back to work. So, uh, I think there's something really exciting brewing. So I'm, I'm pretty, pretty bullish on stable coins, uh, in the next few months. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, I think that makes total sense. Right. I mean, it, for folks coming from traditional finance, it's, sort of the concept of having a reference rate or LIBOR, right? But without all the human flaws that LIBOR has very obviously had in the past. Um, so so just to bring it all back to sort of um, the hackathon, um, pretend I'm someone who's been curious about stable coins, curious about Rye and Frax, especially after this panel. And I've got some weeknights, some weekends to kill, got my MetaMask wallet ready. What do you think I should do first? Um, there's definitely some urine strategies that could be developed for Rai that that are interesting. Uh, there's like more dashboards and stuff that would be cool, uh, like a trading leaderboard to see who's like the best uh, Rai arbitrager. Um, <clears throat> uh, things with the the savior. Uh, Rai Rai has a savior that will like help prevent you from getting liquidated, um, you know, built into the protocol. Uh, some, I think somebody is trying to make a wrapper around Rye, uh, which is like, make it, uh, seem like $1. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I, I'm skeptical about how well that might work. <laughs> um, what about you, Sam? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I think, um, just probably reach out to us. I think I, I say that for both of us that we're super yeah, yeah. available. We're working around the clock. Like, you know, as you see, like we're just, we're just coding nonstop doing this stuff. Cause we're to us, it's not work. It's just like our, our like passion. We're like enthralled in it. Um, but in terms of like technical stuff, uh, there's really, really good things for um, the intersection of like coding and development and, and traditional finance, like the FRAX price index stuff. Um, if, if people want to create a panel, like I mean, said dashboard of tracking, uh, current CPI, uh, rates and, and historical stuff, and then figuring out the most gas efficient way to bring them on chain. Like, for example, one thing we're doing with Chainlink is 
we're trying to create a custom Oracle built for the FPI that brings the traditional finance CPI on chain in a efficient manner. Um, it's once every month, right? Cause, cause the CPI is super, super, <laughs> right? This trad fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's like it's no like, time for it to be useful. Like our our stuff updates every like six hours. <laughs> yeah, right. One of the good things about crypto native CPI is like it'll be real time, right? And it'll yeah. be auditable. Um, but so if you're you're building in the stablecoin space and you're you're into this kind of stuff, um, check out how to build CPI stuff or oracles and you know. Uh, also, just whatever you're building, integrate Rye and Frax as either collateral or usable assets and just kind of get your feet wet in it. Yeah, um, we're at reflexor.finance. There's links to our Discord and stuff. Uh, jump in, tag me uh, or Stefan and be happy to help. Got a plug, Sam? It's uh, just Frax Finance, uh, every, everything Telegram, uh, Discord and Twitter. Cool. Good all right hackers. thanks so much guys that was really fun um hopefully next time we'll all be able to get together again and see where things are at uh and i'll be able to put up a qr code for uh people to send me donations in uh rye or frax perfect so can, uh definitely keep moderating all right thanks guys appreciate all it thanks so much, much.